Perfect. Okay. So <clears throat> yeah, I'm just going to kind of, just like uh, Jack was saying, I'm really just trying to summarize the meat of, of what we talked about here in about 10 minutes for the stuff that I emphasize for young surgeons, really just because it was fresh on my mind. I certainly didn't uh, purport myself to be an expert, um, but because it was new to me and I, I don't have a problem asking questions or looking dumb because uh, I want to get to the, the, the right um, uh, answer. So I asked a lot of questions along the way. And fortunately in Dallas, we had a lot of people that were uh, very helpful in getting us the answer. So really, I'm going to talk about building the practice, you're brand new, things that kind of matter when you're first coming out and stuff that should at least be on your mind, uh, depending on where you're going. So these are the key points we're going to kind of talk about. I have a slide for each one of these um, for things that I think, uh, at least for me, were important. Um, and especially now about two years out, looking back on it, things that I think uh, still kind of hold up. So first thing is, you know, when you're looking for a place, fit is really important. And uh, it's kind of like one of these things that you hear administrators say all the time when they're trying to hire someone about or like football coaches, like the character really matters. But it really does. Um, you can say it in a way that's cheesy, but what really matters is you find a place you want to be. We've all heard the statistic, and it's actually pretty accurate that about 50 percent of doctors are not at the same practice they started at three years out. And I think a lot of that is a fit issue. Um, so you want to think about broad strokes. Do you want to be in a specialty practice? So orthopedic or neuro? Do you want to be in a subspecialty practice? So like a spine only group? Um, there's, of course, hospital employment, academic, military, and there's some other people talking later today about what informed their decision. So I won't get into too much detail, but those are tremendously different, not only in the day to day, but in the implications for salary, uh, ancillary or vertically integrated income. With things like the military, it's an implication for insurance. You know, if you're going to do the career military thing, health insurance is obviously a huge benefit, housing stipends, all that stuff. And then, of course, the people you're taking care of is another uh, difference there with the military. So all those things are valuable things to consider. When it comes to the market, this is something that I think is easy for us to not pay attention to as uh, residents and fellows that don't really think about this. We're training at academic centers. And academic centers, if you're in residency, like I went to UMass or if you're at UT or something, like people are frequently referred to the center and then they might go to the doc. Of course, when you're more experienced, people will come to you directly. But when you're younger, you have patient flow kind of built in. If you're in private practice, you don't really know why they're trying to get a spine doctor there. Are they trying to get someone to just help reduce their overhead? Are they trying to get someone because the other group did and they think they should keep up? Or is there real data that that community is underserved with spine surgeons? You know, the other, it's a nice, if you see, like when I interviewed here, two other spine guys from the other groups, I went by the OR. I was like, what's their OR schedule? Like one of them's doing 400 cases a year. The other one's doing 350. And both of them from other groups said, we really need you to come here. We're like really busy. Like that was awesome. I was like, okay, so there's a real market here. Then I looked at the granular data from the hospital and all that stuff. They paid for all that if it's a hospital or a private group. So access it, ask them. Um, and if they haven't done it, they'll do it because they know that they should be looking at that. So, um, and then payer mix matters. Um, if all your patients are Medicaid, it doesn't mean that they don't need help, but it might mean that you can't keep the lights on in the clinic. So it does matter that you kind of know especially as your practice matures, how can I make sure that I'm getting an adequate payer mix to maintain the, the group or the practice that I want? Um, and then for support, you know, internal referrals for me in an ortho group is great. I got 20 ortho docs. Uh, they only had one spine surgeon here um, and he wasn't doing some of the types of cases I wanted to do um, uh, for some of his practice. So I had a lot of built-in referrals right away, which is helpful. If you're in a spine surgery group, the question is, okay, am I going to be in a market where maybe we don't, we aren't super saturated with our group or where the primaries really like us, um, you know, where I can go meet some people. It's just important to make sure that you're going to have support to build up uh, your practice as you go along. So you're not seeing five people in clinic every day for a year. And, you know, it's normal for a week or two, but you don't want to be doing that for too long. Um, and then you're going to kind of get into this mode that is brand new to you, which is, you know, no longer am I doing what I'm told to do in terms of like residency. You're on this service. You're working for this doctor and fellowship. We're going to clinic this day. You're with Jack today. You're with Rick this day. Like you don't have that. And your team, you know, I took for granted, certainly how good the teams were everywhere. I mean, when I was a TVI, it seemed like everyone was an expert at what they were doing. All the PAs knew what they were doing. Of course, certainly the attendings did. The nurses at their hospital are incredible. And when you go out, you're likely an extension of the practice that you're joining. You're going to have to get an MA or a nurse and you're going to have to have people at the front desk that like you. And that's part of what you want to do when you're at the practice is vet those people. So I went to clinic 
I went to the front desk. I specifically went early to my meeting so that I could meet the front desk people without them knowing that I was a physician. And that was advice someone else gave me. And that was great because I was met with two people that were smiling and just happy to see me not knowing who I was. Um, you know, you can teach people what you need to teach them to be a good spine assistant or medical assistant or front desk. You cannot teach people to be happy. So if you hire someone who might be really smart, but they're not happy or they're not someone that's going to listen to your patients, it's going to be a really long ride for you. So definitely think about that. Um, in spine specifically, what we do can be a little more challenging uh, than some of the other stuff in terms of billing. So if you have people in the office and all they ever do is total joints, um, make sure that they are interested in learning how to do spine or they're going to bring someone in. Uh, Cause let me tell you, mine were interested and it was still uh, six to eight months of them kind of learning how they're like, what do you mean? There's all, there's 22 CPT codes. Like, I'm like, oh, there are, you know? And so they, they kind of had to figure that out. They're going to be helping you a lot with what modifiers to use, when to use them, when stuff gets kicked back, you need to learn how to look at your collections and see if you're getting uh, paid for things, or if they're just saying we didn't get paid and getting rid of it and, and all that stuff. I mean, we did a whole talk on this for, I think an hour, um, so it can get pretty granular, but just be in the game, you know, don't be passive, be involved. You know, I by no means intend to audit my finances, you know, every week for 10 years, but for the first year I did, because I wanted to learn. And then I also wanted to make sure I was holding people accountable uh, in, a, in a collegial way, but to make sure that we were doing things the right way. Um, and then, you know, you want to make sure that you have appropriate reps there. If you're joining a spine group, hopefully you can latch on to some of the reps that are around and ask the, the docs who they use. Um, I was new and I got extremely lucky with a distributor that was moving here that had a lot of experience um, and kind of shared my uh, curiosity with a lot of different companies so that we can make sure we got what we needed in the hospital. Um, but it needs to be someone who, again, hard worker, having experience when you're brand new is pretty much a must. You don't want to get the, the guy who's a week out of the uh, school for being a rep when you're brand new. Like you need to minimize the other inexperienced variables because you have to acknowledge that you are a very inexperienced variable in this situation. And so you want to have as much uh, consistency as you can. Um, and then of course, you're going to think about scribes and things like that to make clinic easier as you go on and a PA or an NP it might not be front of mind, but if you're joining a group with a bunch of other docs, ask them, how did they scale? You know, yeah. Did you get two years in and then you got a PA or an MP? Do you guys share those who rounds on the weekends is it acceptable to have that? Like you need to be thinking about that because ultimately quality of life is important and having some help around you appropriately might help you maintain the OR schedule you want without getting seven divorces, right? You need to be able to be home on the weekend, make the T-ball games, all that stuff. So um, for uh, technology and implants, this I'm, I geek out on this stuff a little bit because I'm really interested in device design and all that. But for even if you're not, you need to make sure that you can use the stuff that you're comfortable with. And if you're going to an academic center, they might have a deal where it's just a pure or striker and that's it. And if that's the case, you just need to know that going in. Um, most other situations are not like that. And just keep in mind, they're going to be as nice to you and as reasonable with you before you sign. So if you make clear expectations, well, I'm going to want to use these and it's HCA, not a big deal. It's on their national contract. Here's the process for getting something else in. Awesome. If it's another smaller hospital, you just need to make clear in the beginning what your intentions are so that they can tell you yes or no. Um, and again, for capital costs and stuff, that's when they're the most generous because they'll look at you as new business and they'll say to acquire this new business that is a cash flowing asset to us. We need to spend a little money up front. It's no different than you buying a house that you're going to rent out. You got to spend money to buy the house to get the cash flow. That's how these big corporations look at it, whether it's a HCA that's hiring you for employment or recruiting. So when I went there, I said, look, I got to have a robot. We need to get another Jackson table. I need the Laveau for posterior cervicals. Here's the list. And don't be intimidated by the cost of that. The worst thing they can do is say no. They're not going to say this guy or this girl is asking for too much. Um, so you need to make sure you get all the stuff you want. Um, that's all I'll say about that part. And then, you know, just keep in mind that, again, you are an asset. Um, you, you generate a lot of money for the hospital, specifically in spine surgery. Uh, so I kind of struggled with feeling like I was asking for too much. And uh, I still did it anyway. And then looking back in it, when a couple of people came after me, I was like, damn, I should have asked for more <laughs> because they they are happy to give it. And I look at the receipts now from the hospital. They charge out crazy numbers. So it's reasonable to get the things that not only for patient safety, but for your convenience, you want that's you like a specific headlight or microscope, tell them you should be comfortable doing the cases that you're going to do that makes the hospital money. Um, and then when it comes to building your base, hospitals have marketing teams, your practice will have marketing teams if those are separate things. 
you need to leverage that. Th those people are paid. So you need to make sure that they're working for you. So if they're making cards and taking them out, they're taking flowers or cookies to groups. I mean, crumble cookies are like $20 and I've never met a human being that doesn't like it. So if there's a PCP's office that you went by last week to say hi to, have them send cookies to it again this week. Thanks again for meeting with us. That's an email that takes five seconds. Put your marketing team on it. So you need to make sure that uh, those people should get a little tired of your emails early on. But when you're not busy because you're new, you need to be out shaking hands and kissing babies and stuff. Don't actually kiss babies, but you know what I mean. Um, and then the relationships with current primary care doctors, that's your partners are going to have relationships. And that's part of why you join this group, right? You didn't join the group because everyone in the group is a jerk. You join it because they're all, they're people that you could see yourself working with. Well, that means that the primaries that like them will probably like you too. So you should ask them who refers you the most, who are the five PCPs that refer you the most, go meet them, go to their office, set up an appointment, bring them lunch. Just tell them, Hey, I'm not here to take up your entire lunch time. I know it's important for the office to hang out a little bit. Just want to spend three minutes, tell you what I do. I had them make a separate business card for me that has, you know, my picture on it, but then it says like, these are the services that we do. You know, we do like motion preservation is a big thing, you know, oh, disc replacements, like most primaries don't even know what that is. So I'd say disc replacements, robotic surgery, and even non-operative back pain. I put on those first cards. I took it off when I went back a year ago, but in the beginning, like I'll take anything, right? And so that sits by the secretary. And when they say, who's that spine guy? They're like, oh yeah, he does this. And then you get sent referrals and it worked really well. You know, you make sure you're personable. I ask, always ask people what's important to them. Whenever you meet someone new, this is basic advice, but the more people get to talk, the more they feel like that interaction went well. So when you meet primary care doctors, remember, it's not all about you. The card says what you do. Ask them about them. Where are you from? Where's your family from? What patients do you like seeing? And then I always ask, what patients do you need help with? Like, is it the 400 pound guy who doesn't understand his back pain is from being 400 pounds? Send him to me and I'll echo what you're saying and I'll help and we'll get a weight loss doc involved. And we'll, you know, I want to be an asset to them and not just a bailout on a, a, the 20th patient that they didn't send to the spine guy they like, you know, so, so make sure you're adding something to the, uh, the relationship. And then on the hospital side, get involved. There's meetings all the time. And I can tell you from doing this for two years, there's no way in hell I want to go to all those meetings when I'm 60. Okay. If they just suck the life out of you, but in the beginning, it's educational. You're learning how the hospital works. You learn how they make decisions, which can help you when you're trying to get them to make the decision that you want. And when you're brand new, it gets your name and face out of it. I get referrals from family members from other docs that work in my hospital, like the CCU docs, because they see me there and they think he must be reasonable because he comes to these and he's reasonable in the meetings. So I get involved when you're young. If you don't like it, you can drop it down the road, but it's really helpful and people see that you're serious and willing to contribute. And if something happens or your infection rate's a little high or something like that, like they're going to be able to brush those things to the side because they know you're there and participating. So you're, you're getting yourself some points uh, with the hospital, which I think is helpful. Um, but when you're bit not busy in the beginning, that's the time to get involved in that stuff. Make sure you focus on the patients. I talked about the kind of chronic back pain patient. You're going to get a bunch of those. You're going to get when you're new, these disaster patients. And there's a reason you're getting the disaster patient, right? They've already seen the other six people in town who said no. Um, so don't be afraid to say no. Like, don't feel like I got to operate sooner than you do. You shouldn't. You should be, if anything, more conservative in the beginning, um, just because you want to make sure that those go really well. You're building your reputation in potentially a new town and you want to make sure that the outcomes are really good. And there are other spine surgeons and whether they're in another group or not, there's the thing I had to accept is there are patients that are operative spine patients, appropriately indicated spine patients. That doesn't mean that they should be performed by me, right? There are other docs in town that can do those things if it's a really high complexity or for whatever reason. So don't be afraid to build relationships with other spine surgeons as well. Um, but the thing that I, I love, I heard this over and over again, is one of the spine docs when I, in my residency used to say, you don't get credit for the mistakes you avoid. And then I heard all the time when it comes to investing stuff, you know, there's no called strikes in investing. And I'll say with elective spine surgery, there's no called strikes. You're never going to get in trouble for not doing something on an elective patient. Now, if they're myelopathic in the hospital or they have caught equina and you're like five beers in on a day you're on call, that's not going to go well. But with elective stuff, don't feel pressured to do literally anything. If anything feels off, if your radar's off, get more tests, get another EMG, get a CT, even if you're not quite sure if you need it, you're never going to get in trouble for ordering more tests or for uh, consulting someone else. And this is also the time to lean on people to train you. You know, I talk all the time to people I did fellowship and residency with, hey, can you take a look at this? Like, am I crazy for doing this? Our fellows thread, which is five of us um, that text back and forth, 
uh, we probably hit 40 or 50 texts every day for the last two years. And I'm not exaggerating. It is, we constantly talk about life, finances, spine surgery, everything. So it's nice to continue relying on those people. And then when it comes to the operation itself, I just say the 10,000 hours start over. You've learned how to be a really good resident fellow. Congratulations. You're not a resident or fellow anymore. Now you have a different job and the 10,000 hours kind of start over a little bit because the perspective changes. So you want to make sure you've got a good relationship with everyone in the room, make sure you're thinking through the whole case. And now you're the responsible one for thinking of plan B, C, D. Because when you're a fellow, we're thinking of that, but I'm just trying to do what Izzy told me to do, what Jack told me to do. And if it doesn't work, there's a little element of you that's like, well, Jack could probably fix this. We'll be okay because he got a plan B and plan C. Well, now you have to have all this and you have to have thought about it ahead of time. And so that means telling a rep to have the corpectomy cage in the back because it's close. And I don't know if I'll be able to get all the discs. Like you have to think of those things. Um, so make sure that you think through that whole thing, that you underbook the cases. So book it for longer than you think it'll need. So that way you don't feel pressured. And if you finish early, you look great. Um, so yeah, in, in regard to all that stuff, Treat people nicely, stay humble. It's nice to be out and be an attending. You're going to get the first paycheck and it's like as much as you made in a year as a resident and that's awesome. But with that comes a lot of new things, new expenses, things you've been delaying and in life, a lot of new stress. And so try to keep the expenses low so you can cover everything and figure out how you can continue to do the things that are really important to you. And so I say, remember your why. Like for me, it was, okay, well then Thursday afternoons, we're not going to have clinics. We got T-ball on Thursday afternoons or I want to make sure I get out you know, Friday by three o'clock or whatever. And the feeling to do the next case or do that one more patient in clinic or whatever, don't have that. You're going to make enough money to get by. That's not going to be an issue. You're going to be able to take care of the patients you can see, but don't overextend yourself. So that way you can provide a long career to your community. You're there for your family and friends when they need you the most. Cause those are the people ultimately that I hate to say this, but it's true. You leave the hospital a year or two after you leave the hospital, the people that you didn't see outside of the hospital, that, I mean, they're not going to talk about you, right? It's going to be the people that you saw outside the hospital that some work friends, but mainly the other friends too, and your family. Those are the people that you build your legacy through. So you just got to make sure that with all the stuff that we talk about, that's super important, um, that you just don't let that take away from the stuff that's more long lasting uh, for your life. So uh, that's it. Hey, John, this is Jens. Great job. Love that family slide. This is uh, ultimately what it's all about, right? Um, yeah. So uh, when you, you were one of those products of the work hour restriction life and uh, they worked you pretty hard, but doesn't kill you at TBI. When you got out in the private practice, how much was the reality of call night and just being up all night and then seeing a room full of patients the next day in clinic or having a long OR day ahead of you? How much did that affect you? How much uh, was that a shock, a reality shock? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the work hour restrictions are, I think most people will agree there needed to be something in place, you know, and, and when I was there, it was 80 hours. Um, we, we, we never recorded more than 80 hours. You know, we, we got a little over that occasionally. That was better preparation. Cause I would say the biggest thing about Texas back and a lot of, you know, really efficient fellowships is we worked really hard when we were there. They didn't waste a lot of our time. Right. So I didn't do a lot of the scut stuff you did in residency. That was just, I'm doing six other people's jobs. You know, we had less of that. Um, which was nice for that year. I mean, I got to put my kids to bed most nights, but you're right. Uh, when I got out, there was a little more. I take call about every fifth night here and I do general ortho call. So I still do a lot of uh, fracture care and then occasionally some spine trauma. Um, <clears throat> and that is more like residency, uh, although it's a little different. You know, when I'm not at a hospital that has residents, the nurses are more likely to take verbal orders and kind of work with us. They understand they're calling me and not a second year resident. So they try not to call at three in the morning. Um, so a lot of those things, I'd say it's in between fellowship and residency, you know, it's better than uh, residency was, um, but it's a little more stressful than fellowship because I'm having to make those decisions. So, you know, ultimately you can control that. I told myself I'd take calls as long as I have student loans. So I'm going to do that to basically pay those things off. Um, but th there's, there is more of that. Um, you're kind of tired. I've operated in the middle of the night a few times and yeah, clinic is exhausting, but like, I'm also addicted to energy drinks. So like those get me through most clinics. Um, the cardiologist that works next door to me hates that. Um, but you know, I think you get, you also get to choose some of that, you know, you're choosing your practice, you're choosing your call burden either before or after you choose the practice. And so I think you have to control what you can control. I'll tell you, I've also, I had a day where I was, uh, just really sick. It wasn't COVID, but I felt terrible. 
And uh, I ended up calling my MA uh, that morning. I was like, you know what? Cancel clinic. Like we'll fit them in later. We'll add another clinic in the afternoon, but I'm just, I'm not going to do this. Like I feel terrible and I didn't sleep all night. And so I've done that one time in two years. I don't anticipate doing it a lot, but that's part of the positive is you have the ability to do that. So I can say, look, unless they're an emergency, I'll see them later this week. And you know, the emergency can see my partner or whatever. So, um, but it's a good question because it's definitely different. Thank you, John. John, that was wonderful. I think you can see why that program has been successful um, with the energy that John injected into it. Um, one of John's part